Jesus told us that if we were going to inherit the kingdom, we would have to become like little children. One of the things that I love about little children is how they have the tendency to simply take us at our word. I can remember our youngest son, Luke, many years ago asked me, Daddy, if God lives in our hearts, why can't we see him? We've become so accustomed to explaining and understanding our faith that if we're honest, we might even admit that we don't have as much childlike faith as we had when we were kids. And maybe we would even say that sometimes we long for that kind of childlike faith. The truth is, we don't view a whole lot as miraculous anymore, do we? We fail sometimes to see how God is orchestrating things, how God is, in fact, behind the scenes putting things together. We oftentimes credit circumstances or we chalk something up to coincidence. I love what a little fellow by the name of Eugene wrote. He said, Dear God, I didn't think orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Tuesday. That was cool. I'm not sure when it happens, but at some point along the journey, we cease to recognize that which is truly miraculous. A little boy named Seymour asked God about it in this way. Dear God, how come you did all those miracles in the old days and don't do any now? The question before us really is, does God still work miracles? We're going to take a brief break from our study in the book of Matthew. Next week, I'm going to be sharing with you a message I've been working on for about 10 years. 10 years being your pastor, they're going to have a before and after picture like they do of presidents, that sort of thing. Uh, But there are some things that I want to share with you in celebration of that great time together. And then we're going to have our sanctity of life observation as we talk about the sanctity of life, which we believe the Bible teaches very clearly. And then we have Dr. Alan Branch, who is going to come and share with us a January Bible study. And then we're also going to have a State of the Church address. But this morning, I want to call our attention to the Gospel according to Luke and the 18th chapter, beginning with verse 35. And I want to speak to you about how miracles happen from Luke chapter 18, verse 35, And I will invite you to stand, please, as we read the Word of God together. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Thank you so much. You may be seated. How miracles happen. I think part of this certainly has to be understood based on how we define a miracle. There's no doubt in my mind there are some things that you need today. There are certainly some things that I need today. There may very well be some miracles that you need God to work out in your life. Now, I realize that we don't see people being raised from the dead like we read about in New Testament times. And the truth of the matter is, I've never heard someone stand up, speak to a storm and say, peace be still and have it actually work. But I believe that God's miracle power is, in fact, still available to his children. I believe that it's still available. So let's notice how miracles happen, and maybe in the process you can determine if you've experienced one. Let's dig in. Number one, I want you to recognize miracles involve the presence of Jesus. Would you say that with me? Miracles involve the presence of Jesus. And let's look again at our text, verse 35. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. You'll notice that Jesus is approaching Jericho. 
that's really only part of the picture. You see, there's more to the story than that which we simply read. The spiritual truth is not that Jesus was simply approaching Jericho, but the big issue was not that Jesus was going to a certain community. The bigger issue is Jesus was approaching a man. Every place Jesus went and everything Jesus did at some level had to do with people. Even in our world today, the things that we see God doing are not simply related to movements or institutions or relegated to some particular geographical location. God's actions always have to do with people. And notice again how Jesus' intervention on behalf of this man illustrates God's mercy to those who have been damaged or incapacitated by life and society. People mattered to Jesus. Individuals, Luke's gospel account just mentions him as a blind beggar. But if you've read much of the New Testament, you recognize that in Mark's gospel, he is referred to by name, and his name is Bartimaeus. And here we find Bartimaeus sitting, and he's begging on the side of the road. Just as a side note, have you ever wondered how you would have responded had you seen Bartimaeus begging? Well, I can tell you how you would have responded. You would react the same way you did, the same way you did to the last person you saw begging. How did you react? That's exactly how you would have reacted. Now remember, Bartimaeus is a man. He's a person. He matters. He's not a dog. He is a human being. He's not a statistic. If you look back with me at Luke chapter 18 and verse 7, you'll recognize that in the very beginning of this chapter, Jesus promised that God will, quote, give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. And now the story picks up with Bartimaeus crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, it was there for the miracle to occur. In this instance, Jesus was there physically in the situations where we really need something of a miracle today. We realize that Jesus is present in spirit. We don't see him, but he is there and he is here nonetheless. Every time a child is brought into the world, guess what? Jesus is there. And every time a precious baby is denied birth, I believe Jesus is there too. Every time someone asks for forgiveness from God, Jesus is there. Every time the doctor comes in and says, I don't understand why he's doing better, but he is, Jesus is there. Every single time a husband and a wife embrace and say, I'm sorry, Jesus is there. And even in the moment, in the moment when the light of this world grows dim and the light of eternity embraces someone crossing that symbolic Jordan, Jesus is there. Miracles involve the very presence of Jesus. And the truth is, I believe, there are more miracles than we readily recognize. We may not verbalize it, and this may not, this may not be you, we may not verbalize it, but sometimes we really live as if God has removed himself from the world. As if God has left the building, as if God were absent from our lives. And we ask the question in the middle of our heartache or our trial or our difficulty, where is God? People ask that all the time. Where is God? Is it his fault that he doesn't answer? Can't he hear us? Is it our fault that we can't find him? Where, after all, is God. A couple had two little boys, ages 8 and 10, and they were really mischievous. They were always getting into trouble. And the parents would always know that if some mischief occurred in their town, the two young sons were in some way involved. The parents were at their wit's end related to what to do about their son's behavior. The mother had heard that the clergyman in their town had been successful in disciplining children in the past, so she asked her husband if maybe they ought to take their kids to see the pastor. And the husband said, well, we might as well. We better do something before I really lose my temper. So the clergyman agreed to speak with the boys, but asked to speak to them individually. The eight-year-old went to meet with him first, and the pastor said, seeking to play the God card, he sat the boy down and asked sternly, sternly, son, where is God? The boy made no response. So the clergyman repeated the question in an even sterner tone, son, where is God? 
And again, the boy made no attempt to answer. And so the clergyman raised his voice even more and shook his finger in the boy's face and said, Son, where is God? And at that, the little boy ran from the room and ran directly home, slamming himself in his closet. His older brother followed him in the closet and said, What happened? And the younger brother replied, We are in big trouble this time. God is missing, and they think we have him. <laughs> Where is God? Listen. He's right here. He's right here. Miracles involve the presence of Jesus. Secondly, not only miracles involve the presence of Jesus, but miracles involve the petition of Jesus. Would you say that with me? Miracles involve the petition of Jesus. And let's look together at verse 37 and following. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Even though Jesus was there physically, he still wanted the request. He still desired to hear the request. He still desires to hear our request. He wants to hear our petition. I believe, in a very simple way, I believe he wants us to realize we need him. Bartimaeus didn't just sit there after all. He asked God for a miracle. Some of us in this place have never experienced much of the movement of God in our lives, maybe because we've never sought God to move in our life. Maybe we've never requested that God would do something great in our lives. For some of us, that verse in James chapter 4 is all too personal, where James writes, You have not because you ask not. We have friends, perhaps, that need to be healed and we've never prayed believing God would actually move. We have loved ones who need to repent and experience the forgiveness and grace and mercy of Christ, but we've never even begun to ask in earnest. Our families are falling apart in our nation and we would rather listen to Oprah or Dr. Phil than consult the Word of God. It's no wonder, brothers and sisters, the world is in such a mess. Dare I say it, it's no wonder churches are in such a mess. We've ceased to petition God. I can think of someone I know well that needs to be saved, and I'm not going to pray, God, whatever your will is, I'm going to pray, please, God, save him. Because God's Word says that God wills that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if God chooses to draw that person to Himself, and that person responds in faith, certainly that's God's prerogative and that's God's business. But I'm telling you this morning, I'm not going to make excuses for God. I'm going to bring my petitions to God and leave the results with Him. Notice how the blind man does it. He doesn't want anybody to know he needs help, right? He's embarrassed because of what he's having to ask for, right? He's concerned about what other people might think, right? Wrong. He doesn't care what they think. He cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder if we don't pray, pray some audacious prayers because we're afraid if God doesn't come through how we're going to look in front of our friends or whether or not we think we're going to have to try to defend God. Listen to me very carefully. God was doing fine long before we got here. And He's going to be just fine long after we're gone. He doesn't need our defense. Do you know why people don't petition God? They don't believe He'll do anything. They're afraid of what others might think. Maybe we're just not all that concerned about what it is we're actually facing. We come to a situation and, in effect, oftentimes say, I'm doing okay, God. If I need your help, I'll ask for it. And the truth is, far too often, we never ask. Miracles involve the petition of Jesus. Pray. I want to encourage you to pray. And when you have prayed about some great need in your life, 
Guess what? Pray some more. And when you think you've wrapped up your petition, finally think again and then pray some more. Bombard heaven with your praying. Don't depend on anybody else or anything else but Jesus. And every single time things work out for you, remember who it was that did the working out. It's Jesus, right? So let's not be like the man who was lost deep in the woods and later describing the experience. He explained how frightened he was and how he had prayed. Did God answer your prayer? Someone asked. Oh no, the man said. Before God got a chance, a guide came along and showed me the path out. Miracles involve the presence of Jesus and miracles involve the petition of Jesus. Thirdly, I want you to recognize miracles involve the purpose of Jesus. Would you say that with me? Miracles involve the purpose of Jesus and it is found in verse 40. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Jesus asks him the key question, what do you want me to do for you? Now, let me be very clear. I, I'm not encouraging you to begin to believe that you should presume upon God's grace and think for one moment He is the great cosmic bellhop always asking the question, may I help you? But the issue here is Jesus' purpose was to heal the man, to minister to him at the very point of his need, and in fact, I think it's good to be reminded it might very well be the case that God desires to do the same for you. I don't think it's wrong for us to think through the implications of that question even today. What do you need Jesus to do for you? Now, everybody relax. I'm not talking about asking for a $65 million jet. I'm not. But the truth of the matter is we have a God who possesses everything and if he possesses everything and wants to bless his children from time to time, it's certainly his prerogative to do so. And so I think it's fair to ask what we need Jesus to do for us. After all, we do believe in miracles, right? And after all, the Bible says nothing is impossible with God. But I think we have to be responsible stewards of that which God might bless us with. The issues of miracles cannot be explained away. But we should also notice this, and this is vitally important because there's so much wrong theology about this. Notice every time Jesus performed a miracle in his ministry, it somehow served to get the attention of unbelievers. In some way, shape, or form, it always pointed people toward the kingdom of God. It always highlighted or explained the gospel of Jesus and gave glory to God the Father. Here's a man in the middle of the street, blind and begging. Jesus takes note of his lot in life. He asks him what he needs, and then he heals him. Think how that must have hit the unbelieving crowd. Can you imagine? If Jesus really was the Messiah they would have been thinking, why would he waste his time with somebody like this? Again, here we see the kind of value that our Lord puts upon people. Bartimaeus mattered just as much as the scribes and Pharisees and all the rest of the religious elites. Here we see Jesus' ministry extending to the down and outs, the outcast, and the oppressed in society. And that, by the way, is exactly where the ministry of the church should extend today too. Who knows? Maybe if our ministry extended to the outcasts, maybe we would see more of the miraculous. Maybe if the church universal, and I'm talking about a big broad tent, maybe if some of the people on television were more concerned about the poverty in the world than they were about their $65 million jets, we'd see some real miracles. Every miracle involves the purpose of Jesus, and His purpose is always redemptive. I believe every difficulty we face will either strengthen us or defeat us. If we allow it to strengthen us, then we will allow all the other people in the world the privilege of seeing God's grace in action through our lives. 
So miracles involve the presence of Jesus. They involve the petition of Jesus. Miracles involve the purpose of Jesus. Fourthly and finally, miracles involve the provision of Jesus. Would you say that with me? Miracles involve the provision of Jesus. Verse 42 and following. And he said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. I don't care what crisis you face and where you search for answers. I want you to know something. The only real miracles come from the hand of God. It is the provision of Jesus that adds miracles to our journey. The man says, let me recover my sight. In essence, all he's saying is, Jesus, all I really want is to be able to see. And Jesus does not shrug him off. He doesn't send him somewhere else. Jesus deals with the man's request head on. He cares. He loves him. And he offers his miraculous provision to meet the need. Jesus says, son, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Now listen to me very carefully. Sometimes the provision we need is not something from Jesus. Maybe sometimes the provision is simply Jesus Himself. The provision and the answer for whatever you face is found in Jesus. But notice too what the man did when he received his sight. He followed Jesus and he glorified God. And because of what happened and his response to it, other people around him began to glorify God as well. Every miracle involves the provision of Jesus and always gives us an opportunity to offer praise and adoration back to God. Think with me for just a moment. What is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Now, could it be that Jesus had something to do with that? You bet. He offered His provision then when you experience whatever that greatest thing was. And I want you to know He offers His provision today as well. Every time there's a miracle, Jesus is involved. And you know what? Whether it seems impossible or not, whether it seems too big or too small, I believe that Jesus is still in the business of miracles. I think, however, sometimes, maybe too often, we dismiss that which is truly miraculous as simply being a coincidence. People's lives are changed by the gospel of Jesus. Is that a miracle? If you had known my dad... 40 years ago, and you knew my dad today, you would say the gospel, the miracle working power of the gospel of Jesus changed his life. And I want you to know something. The gospel of Jesus is a miracle that changed my life. And you look at me and you say, you're not much of a miracle. Well, maybe not, but if you knew the truth, if you knew the truth, you'd know I really am a miracle. And you are too. You are too. Every time a doctor opens up your body and takes something out to bring healing, no matter what kind of procedure they call it, it's a miracle. When people who have been estranged from one another lay their weapons down and choose to reconcile, that's a miracle. Ray Stedman has told the story of a time when he and his wife were driving through Oregon and his little daughter, Susan, was along with them and she had developed a fever the night before when they were staying in a hotel, but it didn't seem serious. But as they drove along, all of a sudden the little girl went into convulsions. Her eyes turned up, her body began to jerk, and she was obviously in great danger. Stedman's heart clutched. He stopped the car, grabbed his little girl, and stumbled across the road to a farmhouse that happened to be visible, happened to be visible, nearby. It was about six o'clock in the morning, but the frantic father thundered at the door. And when a woman appeared, he cried out, my daughter is very sick. She's having convulsions. Do you have a bathtub where we could put her in some water? The lady was so taken aback, she hardly knew what to say. So she motioned down the hall and without waiting for any words, Stedman pushed the front door open, went down the hall and started running water in the tub. Then they called a doctor and they got her to the doctor's office. Everything turned out okay. But he said he never forgot that moment when it looked as though his daughter was going to die. He found out later that this farm family had the only bathtub and the only phone for miles around. Coincidence? How about 
miraculous. I have a good friend. He's a pastor. His name is Phil. He's one of the guys in ministry that I look up to. Phil was dismissed from a church some 23 years ago. And I saw the letter that they sent out to the congregation before they took the vote to dismiss him. And the charge that was brought against my friend was an overemphasis on evangelism. Listen, I, I can give you a lot worse than that on me, I'm just telling you. So, the overemphasis on evangelism. So he was fired, but there was a group of people there that said, we want a pastor who likes to emphasize evangelism, so they planted a church. And he's been in that church for some 22 years. And, and from time to time, things would get a little cross with some people, and recently things got a little more cross with some people, and things got to the point where it didn't look as if there was going to be any reconciliation, even though some people said they wanted that, and he said he wanted that. And then they said, we really don't want reconciliation, but instead we want resignation. So rather than cause a big stink in the church, my friend Phil resigned with no place to go. He does a radio, or does a radio um, show, and he was being interviewed by a guy named Harold, and he was telling Harold the story off the airwaves about what had just happened to him in his church. And Harold said, I've got a friend that you need to meet because he's just starting a ministry that I think you would be perfect for. Now, in the meantime, my friend had sold his house, bought a house in Arlington, Texas, where his kids and grandkids now reside. So they purchased a house in Arlington, Texas. My friend met with this other guy who was just starting a ministry, and they started talking about the ministry. The guy's ministry is for businessmen to use their businesses for a platform for the gospel of Jesus. It's also a ministry to uh, veterans and how they can experience the power and grace and healing of Jesus. And then he wanted to start a ministry to wounded pastors who had been through unhealthy and difficult church situations. And so this guy said to my friend Phil, you're the guy. You're the guy that brought, God has brought into my life to lead this ministry. And Phil said, man, that would be great. The problem is, I just bought a house in Arlington, Texas. And the guy that he was having breakfast with leaned back and laughed and said, you know what, you know where my world headquarters for my ministry is? Arlington, Texas. Coincidence? No. I think miraculous. Miraculous. 